Um, okay, let me share. I've got a few slides today. Um, okay, make it so I can see people. Um, great. So I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, so today's meeting, we don't have a lot to cover, so hopefully we'll be um, relatively quick. Um, okay, so first, this is something that we've been doing for a few months now. Um, at the beginning of these meetings, I like to do a quick minute on um, inclusivity. And this month, I thought we'd talk about um, inclusive terminology. Um, so this is something that has come up over the past maybe five or six years um, in the tech sector, or at least has become front of mind in the past few years. Um, you know, there's some commonly used words that we have in our programming and in technology that have, you know, negative historical contexts or just negative connotations. Um, and I think that this is a really great opportunity, not just to, you know, change terminology to change terminology, but to actually make things more precise. So I think a really good example is um, in Jim 5, we had master ports and slave ports. Um, and we changed this uh, four years ago now um, to request or responder ports, which are much more precise terminology. Um, I'd always been confused by the master slave, which one was senders and which ones was receivers. Um, but request or responder is much more um, precise. I think an interesting note when we did this, it was a change that I really thought would only take like a week to do, um, but it ended up taking like two or three months um, of multiple people working on it. it. It was a lot more difficult to change than expected. Um, these kinds of things are sometimes really deeply rooted in not only the code, but also documentation and stuff. Um, now, granted, I, I will point out that sometimes there's some trade-offs in projects like Gem5 where we're implementing others' designs. So sometimes other people use these uh, you know, use terminology and then it becomes a trade-off between whether we want to differ from the terminology that we're implementing or um, use the same terminology, even if it's not uh, the most precise or has these negative connotations. I think when making these decisions, you know, we should really be thinking about what's the most readable, understandable, and maintainable um, terminology. So again, a good example is master slave to request a responder. This is much easier to understand for new people. Um, so yeah, in Gem 5, we've been doing this update over the past few years um, and um, making these changes in Gem 5. And you know, if you see other things that can be improved, please make pull requests. These are things, these are good examples of pull requests that are uh, good like first time uh, contributions. So we, uh, are very receptive to these kinds of changes. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, two quick announcements um, or reminders. So we have the Gym 5 Bootcamp this summer from July 29th to August 2nd. Um, be paying attention to mailing lists. More information will be coming soon. Um, also, for those of you working at companies, which there's a couple out there, I will be hitting you up soon about sponsorships. I think this is a great opportunity to build the workforce of people who could come work for your company soon. Um, so sponsoring students to come, I think, will be beneficial for everybody. Um, and the other announcement is that we have a Gym 5 tutorial at HPCA in like two weeks, which Bobby will be leading. So if you're in um, Europe, this would be a good opportunity to go learn more about Gym 5. Um, it's an all-day event, and there'll be a lot of focus on um, new features and the Gym 5 standard library. Right, Bobby? Do you have anything to add? No, it's very much a, uh, yeah, it's in Edinburgh, it's here. Uh, yeah, it'll be all day, and as Jason said, kind of both a crash course, but also I think a good brush up for experienced users, and I'll try my best to cover the latest features in Gym 5 23.1. Cool. Um, okay, so with that, um, I actually don't have anything else from our side. So um, Nick and Marios, you reached out wanting to talk some about uh, the RISC-V hypervisor extension. 
I'm excited to hear. Correct. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, um, yeah, so if Marius could share his uh, screen. Um, okay, great. So, yeah, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nick, uh, and I'm going to be presenting uh, an overview of the development work uh, we have been carrying out uh, with my fellow PhD student, uh, George Marius. Um, our goal is to eventually support uh, the RISC V hypervisor extension in Gen5. Um, as I said, uh, we're both uh, PhD students at the University of Athens, um, working in the Computer Architecture Lab. Our professor is uh, Dimitris Gizopoulos, and we're also supervised by George Papadimitriou, who is a postdoc researcher uh, working with Professor Gizopoulos. And also Vasilios Karakostas, uh, another professor working in the lab with us, uh, helping us with uh, problems and stuff. Yeah, so moreover, uh, this work is also motivated uh, by the fact that uh, our university is a partner uh, in the Vitamin 5 uh, European project, uh, which is concerned with uh, deploying uh, a complete uh, RISC V uh, hardware and software stack for cloud-based services. Um, and the big part of that is uh, for the hardware platform to support the H extension. There are actually three platforms, an FPGA, uh, QMU, and Gen5. And uh, our, our implementation, as, uh, our, our focus, our task as University of Athens is um, with uh, extending Gen5 to develop the necessary support for the H extension. Um, yeah, this pretty much sums up the introduction uh, and our motivation. So, uh, okay, let's get into an overview of the things we've done, the extension process. Um, okay, so when it comes to the H extension and what it requires, uh, we can we can hardly like separate it into four big parts. Uh, one part is uh, the registers, the new CSRs that are needed for the hypervisor. And to be precise, uh, it's about 26 uh, new CSRs that we need. Uh, the second part is interrupts and exceptions. Uh, we have some new exception codes and interrupts, uh, which are guest uh, guest page faults and uh, virtual timer interrupts etc uh, the third part is the extension to the memory uh, translation unit uh, which should support uh, two stage translation now instead of the simple one state translation um, being done currently without the H extension and uh, there, uh, we should implement uh, G-Stage uh, working, which is uh, covered in the RISC-V specification for uh, translating guest physical addresses to host physical addresses. Um, and the final part is that the hypervisor extension specifies some special hypervisor instructions, which are some types of memory fences that are selective to, to what they uh, evict from the TLBs. Uh, for example, you can evict uh, just guest entries or host entries. And the other thing is some special memory instructions that allow uh, the hypervisor when executing to activate the two-stage translation machinery without actually changing its privilege. Um, yeah, so this is like the, a, a big uh, uh, a big overview of the work. It's in four parts. Um, another thing is that uh, with the H extension, there are some new privilege levels. Um, so on the left, you can see that without the H extension, we just have the firmware uh, in machine mode. The operating system, for example, Linux running in supervisor mode. And then the process running on Linux is just in user space. Um, so when we incorporate the H extension, uh, again, we start from the machine mode at the lower level. Then uh, a layer is added at privilege uh, with uh, number two, which is the hypervisor. 
Um, and on top of the hypervisor, uh, you have now another two levels in a virtualized environment, which are the virtualized uh, supervisor and the virtualized user. Um, you can also run in a non-virtualized environment. Uh, can you go back, please? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and on the right, on on the right of the right picture, you can see that you can also run in a non-virtualized environment, just having the Linux running on the hypervisor level, and then uh, you can have a user space without uh, any virtualization. Okay, uh, next one, please. Okay, so for the registers, uh, what we've done essentially is mapped all the new CSR registers, which are uh, uh, detailed in the specification. And these are either new uh, MISC registers, for example, eight status, which is the hypervisor status register, must be mapped to a, a separate MISC register, um, whereas some registers are aliases and are backed by one bigger uh, MISC register. For example, hypervisor interrupt enabled is a CSR that is mapped into the MISC register interrupt enable, which carries with different masks all the interrupt enables for different uh, privileges. Um, moreover, we extended the register bit fields to support uh, fields in registers that are required by the hypervisor extension. For example, the status register uh, has a lot of new bits. I, I, I'm not sure how many, it's like four or five that weren't there in the bit field. So we just added them in the correct positions with the uh, correct names. Um, another thing with register is um, that in virtualized supervisor mode, uh, you need uh, register swapping because um, the, the software running is accessing uh, S registers, supervisor registers. So for example, if a Linux kernel is virtualized and it's running on a virtual supervisor mode, it doesn't know that it's being virtualized. So it, the software just accesses S registers. So what the hardware must do, what Zen5 must do, is identify that we're running in VS mode and implicitly redirect all the accesses to VS registers that are kept separately uh, in other MISC registers. So for example, when we are in VS mode and uh, for example, software is reading S status, we implicitly redirect the access to VS status. Um, and the final thing is that we have some new uh, CSR masks for reading and also for writing. Um, next, please. Okay, so I think uh, that we found out, uh, we're not like 100% sure, but we think it's a small improvement to do this. Um, so Gem5 version 23.1 uh, supports masks for visible bits uh, in different privileges. So the, the bits I can read essentially. But uh, this convention, uh, we, we found out that uh, it does not respect some bits that are read only because uh, the same mask is also being used for writing. So if you can see a bit, you can actually write a bit. And we were able to, to produce a test um, which was actually changing uh, a read-only bit in Gem5, whereas when we simulated the same test in Spike, which is the standard uh, RISC-V ISA simulator, the, the write was ignored, which is the, the correct behavior in this case. So we decided that we should create uh, a separate set of masks for writing uh, into registers, which respect uh, read-only bits as the spec uh, requires. Okay, so next one. Yeah, now for, yeah, the second part was interrupts and exceptions. Um, we created some new fault types because uh, we have uh, new types of uh, interrupts, uh, guest page faults, virtual environment calls, etc. And yeah, most, most of the work was actually in extending uh, the invocation, the, the method that invokes the fault, so that uh, the fault is handled at the correct uh, privilege level, because there are a lot more conditions now. Uh, so it's, it's an extension. There are more cases to decide to which privilege the fault is being delegated. 
Um, yeah, and another thing is that uh, now instead of having just illegal instruction faults, uh, we also have virtual instruction faults in some cases. There are like uh, 20 cases that the spec mandates should throw a virtual instruction fault, uh, which we, we try to implement as closely to the spec as possible. Um, yeah, so next one. Okay, and now uh, I'll uh, leave it to George Marios to present you the, the rest of the extension process, which starts with two-stage translations, and then we have um, hypervisor instructions as well. So, George Marios. Thank you, Nick. Uh, on the left uh, figure, you can see the basic uh, SV39 uh, translation, which is already implemented in Gen5. Now with uh, ENS extension implemented, ENS extension on, we have two states uh, translation, which uh, basically contain this app register, uh, which uh, contains the, the base address of uh, page tables. And then every guest uh, physical address that uh, produced by the page table, virtual page table entry has to be translated to host physical address via G-Stage. Also with uh, edge extension uh, on, we can do only G-Stage uh, translation, only uh, the small uh, figure with uh, edge capture register on top, and the one stage only, the, uh, let's say the basic uh, translation, which is already done as, as V39. Uh, what we have uh, changed uh, in Gen5, we have changed the, the basic, uh, we have extended the basic working logic in order to support the previous mentioned uh, works. This stage only, and the two stage translation, which contains two, uh, two stages. First, uh, the virtual stage, which supported to do the guest virtual address to guest uh, physical address which is a host virtual address. So we have to un uh, translate, it, translate it to a host physical. And we have the G stage for this as the, the second stage. Secondly, we have uh, changed, we have new functions uh, in order to produce the, the effective privilege and the effective virtualization, which are uh, the privilege and virtualization in order to access the memory. Why uh, we have done this? Because the, the, the G-Stage accesses has to be done as if we are on, on user, as if the privilege is a pri user, user privilege. And then the hypervisor memory instructions, which uh, it, uh, then uh, they be discussed later, they have to, uh, they have to be in, on a virtualized environment, as if the, virtual, the V-bit is on. Finally, uh, we change the, the TLB uh, check permission function, which is, uh, contains the, the condition in order to raise uh, a page fault. We extend it in order to support guest page fault and uses uh, the effective privilege and effective virtualization mentioned uh, before. Now let's talk about the hypervisor restrictions. We have uh, set them on uh, decoder file. We have new fences, as Nico said, new loads, HLV and HV, HLVX, and new stores, HSV, uh, byte, uh, half, half and side, etc. All of these categories. And we have changed the mem.isa file with a new format about hypervisor load and stores in order to change the execution logic, which contains the new execution logic about this, uh, this instruction in order to do the two states translation as mentioned before. Now let's talk about the current state of our project. In the code starts, we have done uh, seven, 17 commits, we have changed 20, 20 files, and we have done, as you can see, uh, plenty of additions and deletions. The mainly affected files are uh, the, the MISC uh, header file, which contains the, 
the masks and the, the new CSR definitions. TLB, page stable worker, and a file, uh, which contain the, the, the logic behind the two states translation uh, new permission we have uh, done. And finally, the decoder Dotaiza with uh, the new hypervisor instructions and the, uh, the uh, some instruction also change like Emirates Red in order to support the current uh, the current uh, spec version. Uh, it is uh, significant to be mentioned that uh, our implementation is basically validated with atomic uh, CPU which has a result that we have we currently can boot uh, linux with a hypervisor extension on and we have uh, found that uh, we have to implement mo uh, many things in order to do this with uh, an out of order cpu like uh, extend uh, the packet uh, transfer logic uh, during the the two states translation now let's talk about validation these uh, are the tests that we have uh, utilized in order to validate our uh, our approach. Uh, in the, in the, uh, on the left uh, column, you can see the register uh, the register test. This test uh, changes some bit fields uh, on the register. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, M status or uh, memory interrupt pending, and checks the values of other registers in different privilege levels. Uh, as you can see, this test is passed. And this test is uh, checks the values in this register because some registers are subject uh, of other registers. Uh, as an example, uh, HIP, SIP uh, are subject of MIP. In the main column, you can see the exceptions in the hypervisor uh, in, in instruction tests. On top, uh, uh, this is the interrupt uh, test, which is passed. And on bottom, you can see the, the test, which validates the hypervisor instructions and raises uh, page faults uh, in some cases. You, you can see that the test is failed, but uh, this has the same behavior in Spike. Uh, finally, the two stage translation test on, on bottom on top you can see the two stage translation test which is passed and uh, on bottom this is the only G stage uh, translation which can be done if uh, VSAT register has uh, a bare mode. Now uh, let's talk about the Xvisor which is a type 1 hypervisor. On left, uh, you can see the bootloader, uh, the bootloader messages, and in, uh, in the right uh, figure, you can see that we have get a prompt from Xvisor. Uh, this message uh, help. Uh, you can see some messages help uh, net etc. And we are also happy that uh, uh, that the reading from uh, MI uh, uh, register shows that we have its extension uh, on. In the advisor, we have a small uh, issue that uh, will be discussed. We'll discuss about it uh, a few minutes later. Our future steps uh, we have to do is to extend our approach with uh, validation, more tests which uh, make us uh, more uh, which uh, we can uh, further validate our approach the the xvisor let's talk about the xvisor type which is type one uh, hypervisor we have to solve the input uh, and output issue uh, currently uh, approximately five or five of six keyboard presses are ignored we have this uh, issue and after we solve this we can uh, run a guest virtual machine on, on Xvisor. And then after this, we uh, we're opposed to boot a virtual machine with uh, KVM, which is a type, two, a type two hypervisor on, on Linux. Have you got any questions? Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, 
I, I yeah, I, I have a few questions. I, I'll start since I'm leading the meeting. I'll take that uh, um, position of power here. Um, so really, really cool. For, first of all, amazing work. I am, I think, as someone who's done some research on virtual memory and virtualization, I can't express how excited I am to be able to have something like this in Gym 5. This is really cool. Um, a quick aside, uh, so FYI, we submitted a request to do a workshop at ISCA this summer. Um, it's a long way away, <laughs> but we would, um, assuming that workshop is approved, um, this would be a really, really good contribution to the workshop to come talk to a broader audience about what you've been doing, just FYI. Um, so one bigger question, um, and, and I think, yeah, Giacomo is here, which is great. So my question is actually to Giacomo, which is, does ARM have any support for the hypervisor extensions in ARM? And if so, is there some stuff that we should be making sure that we correlate between the RISC-V implementation and the ARM implementation? Uh, sorry, Jason, I missed the last bit. Uh, would you mind repeating that again, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, so does ARM Engine 5 have any support for hypervisor extensions? And if so, is there some correlation that we should be doing between the um, RISC-V changes that um, they're pushing versus what's already in there for ARM? So yes, we do support uh, um, uh, virtualization, uh, which is basically the EL2 exception level. Um, related to the second part of your question, I don't think there's much that uh, can be done like that is shared across the ISAs. Um, the only thing I can think of is something that could be useful, but I'm not sure whether it's in the scope with this project is to basically have like a sort of common way of doing uh, um, table walks um, uh, when you actually have like a second stage of translation um, because everything is relatively easy when you are in atomic mode and things becomes a bit convoluted when you are in timing mode and you start a translation. So, so but that's not like what it, it's not there a common framework to actually do that and that can be shared across ISAs. So I would say that at the moment, there's really nothing that uh, is overlapping, but um, I can see Andreas is also on the call, so I don't know if he has any, anything else, and also Richard, if they have anything else to add to that. I think the, the sort of general thing that we could share across ISIS would be uh, part of the TLB infrastructure, which I think is entirely ISIS specific at the moment. Um, so I, I think other than ARM, most, implementations use a single level fully associated TLB. Yeah, I think that's right. And yeah, while the code is not shared at all between ISIS, um, I know at least for RISC-5 and x86, it's a big old copy paste job, um, which isn't great. Uh, so I guess that, that it's kind of related to the other thing that I wanted to bring up is um, you all mentioned um, I think, George, you mentioned that uh, um, you're having some issues with the multi, uh, multi-step multi translation in O3. And, and I'm kind of curious with the ARM implementation and, and maybe also with this, like, does it make sense to extend to the request to have both guest virtual address as well as the user mode virtual address or the guest physical address? in hypervisor mode? I think the only reason you would want that this is for debugging. So if you if you do add the guest fiscal or the intermediate fiscal as we call it, you would have to add a VM ID as well, just to identify the other space. Um, which, you know, that's not a problem. Um, I can't see why you would use it outside of debug though. Well, I think maybe it could help in 
the uh, well, yeah, I don't know. But if we're having issues with knowing what stage of translation we're in, um, that could also carry that information with us that we've already translated from guest virtual to host physical and now, or sorry, guest physical. Now we need to translate from guest physical. Do you have a need that outside of the page table walking? So maybe George, can you dive in? Do, do, do you have any more details on what the issue is that you're running into with the O3 CPU and doing the page table walking? Uh, the truth is that we haven't checked um, uh, further with O3 CPU. Okay. Uh, in our project, we have to 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 boot the hypervisor, so we ma mainly focused on atomic. We haven't uh, see further the out of order uh, CPU. We have to implement, uh, we have to extend our logic in uh, hypervisor uh, instructions, and we don't have uh, so much time in order to do that. So we're yeah. implementing Atomic, and then we can extend this uh, out of order. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so I mean, I guess may maybe a, um, if you get there, a suggestion would be to look at how the multi-stage translation works in ARM and maybe yeah. inspiration from that. Yeah. We've been doing that uh, already in some, to some degree. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's helpful. Uh, yeah. So, so right now the, the TLB logic, uh, like which entries will be kept, uh, if we will have a tagged TLB, et cetera. It's kind of pending. We haven't decided that, uh, what should be done and uh, if we should keep like uh, intermediate translations as you were discussing earlier. Um, yeah, these are some things to think about. But there are also some instructions that uh, don't make uh, uh, a lot of sense if you don't actually know uh, if the mapping, like, there are some fences that are supposed to invalidate just guest entries. So if your TLB is not tagged uh, with whom the entry is for, uh, you can't do that. And you just have to, to flash everything. Yeah. Yeah, I, but, but go ahead. Yeah, as Andreas was kind of hinting at, I think that the whole TLB infrastructure outside of our event can be greatly improved. Mm -hmm. The whole translation infrastructure could be greatly improved. Um, so if, that, if that's something you want to contribute, we would be more than happy. <laughs> uh, if that's outside the scope, then you know, ho hopefully somebody else gets excited about it and um, contributes. Um, does anybody else have questions or comments? Um, I have like a few other little things that I'll probably post in the chat, um, but I want to make sure others have an opportunity. Okay, um, I guess uh, real quick, I'll say that the uh, bug that you seem to found, have found in the read-only bits, um, it'd be great if you created a separate PR for that. So that can be reviewed and pushed in quicker than having to review all 20 changes. Um, yeah. I know it's sure. kind of a pain to do that in GitHub, but I think that would be good. Um, And then the other, uh, my, my final thought is, uh, this looks great. I think we should go ahead and merge as much as we can. That it, it, as long as we think that it's reasonable and you know your tests are passing, I'm happy to have it in as it is. And we can continue to improve it over time, add O3 support and these kinds of things. I'm a strong proponent of getting a minimum viable product committed and then improving over time, not waiting for perfection before we merge things. Thank you, thank you. Uh, cool. Anybody have anything else to discuss around the um, risk five hypervisor? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. Again, I am. I cannot express how excited I am about this. This is really cool. This is going to uh, really give us a new kind of tool to 
use in research, which is awesome. Um, okay, with that, does anybody else have anything else they want to bring up for discussion today? I don't have anything else. And also, and this, this is George from University of Athens. And also, don't forget that we are uh, still working on our next steps, which are to put the uh, not only the bare metal hypervisor, but also the type to hypervisor, which uh, is the, the KVM. This is our final uh, target, right? So this is our next steps. Which would be super cool. <laughs> yeah, of course. And also, and uh, and, and the microarchitectural changes uh, that uh, can be done and the out of order, as uh, Nick and George uh, said. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay. Any other Gem Five related business that anybody wanted to bring up? Any PRs that people want to discuss, or any issues um, that people want to discuss? Okay, great. Well, in that case, we can end it here. Uh, thank you all for joining. And um, I will see you all in a month or so. We'll announce soon what the date of the next one, next meeting will be. And thanks for those of you joining from Greece for joining so late. I know it's, uh, time zones are hard. So thanks for joining late. Thanks for having us, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you all later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.